I am currently walking along the famed Terps Woods here at Gettysburg, the site of heavy fighting on July 1st of 1863. You and I were members of the famed Red-Legged Devils, and we're about to be involved in some pretty heavy fighting over the next three days here at Gettysburg. And we're going to march in the footsteps of the 14th Brooklyn, commonly known as the 84th New York, and we're going to see this battle through their eyes. Okay, so let's orient ourselves. We are standing next to the famed Herbs Woods. If you still don't know where we are, here is the statue of Mr. Burns. In a distance there, you have McPherson's Ridge, and beyond that you have Seminary Ridge, where the famed cupola sits. And if you need another landmark, here's the McPherson Barn, and beyond the McPherson Barn you have the famed Railroad Cut. So, the 84th New York, for the sake of this video, we're going to refer to them as the 14th Brooklyn, but they went by the 84th New York as well. So the 14th Brooklyn was in the 2nd Brigade in the 1st Corps, and the 1st Corps was reaching the outskirts of Gettysburg here, and they would drop their packs near the Emmitsburg Road near the Kadori property. And they would double quick across the very field that Pickett's Charge would take place on July 3rd of 1863, and they'd begin forming line of battle in this general direction. Now, it's important to note that the 2nd Brigade was the 1st Infantry to arrive here. They were leading the 1st Corps when they came to Gettysburg, not the Iron Brigade. Now, the Iron Brigade was quickly on their heels, but the 2nd Brigade was the 1st Infantry Regiment to arrive here. And they began forming line of battle directly in front of us. So you would have had the 14th Brooklyn and the 95th New York of Lysander Cutler's Brigade forming directly in front of us. Now, this brigade split and the rest of the brigade formed on the other side of the railroad cut in that general direction. And on that side, you had the 76th, the 147th New York, and the 56th Pennsylvania. So they formed what was called a Demi Brigade on this side. And commanding that Demi Brigade was Colonel Edward Fowler. So they would form up here, the 95th New York and the 84th New York, and they would begin advancing in this general direction. And then you had the Herps Woods here, where the Iron Brigade was forming their line of battle, and they were advancing through the Herps Woods against James Archer's Brigade and beginning to push back the Confederate forces back in this direction here. So here we have the Herps Woods in the distance here, and right here is the first marker for the 14th Brooklyn. Now this is their general position. When they took the field here and they would advance up till this point, pushing back Confederates under the command of James Archer. Now the Iron Brigade would have been to our left on the camera, but on the right, you had the rest of Lysander Cutler's brigade engaged heavily with Joe Davis's brigade, who was the nephew of Jefferson Davis, and things weren't going well on the north side of the railroad cut here. Union forces were beginning to falter, and now the Union forces on this side of the cut had a Confederate force on their flank. So Colonel Edward Fowler would reposition the 14th Brooklyn and the 95th New York back this way. They would about face, march back this way. Then he would reform them into lines of battle facing this direction. You had Confederate forces sweeping this way, pushing back the rest of Lysander Cutler's brigade. And now they were dead set on rolling up the entire Union flank here 
on this portion of the cut. So I want to try and keep you as oriented as possible. So the 14th Brooklyn and the 95th New York would have taken the field. Herbst Woods is right behind me and advanced in this direction here. We were just at their monument right here. So they would advance in this direction, engage Confederate forces. When Edward Fowler would notice Confederate forces advancing on her flank behind you on the camera. So he would about face his men and begin marching back towards Seminary Ridge. And as you can see, you have the McPherson barn here in the background. So he would reposition his men to meet this new threat on now our left flank. It just was our right flank. But now he's going to reposition us to align with Joe Davis's Confederate Brigade on our left. And as soon as we pass the barn here, Railroad Cut is just beyond this corn here. He's going to reform our line. So now I am facing directly at the Railroad Cut. And now we're going to begin our advance towards this new threat. Now also joining this fight is the 6th Wisconsin. The 6th Wisconsin was held in reserve near the Lutheran Seminary when they were dispatched along with the 14th Brooklyn and the 95th New York to meet this new threat. Now this isn't the first time that the 14th Brooklyn and the 6th Wisconsin had fought together. They fought together in the cornfield at Antietam. They fought together during the Chancellorsville campaign and now they're fighting together here at Gettysburg and they're going to continue to fight together when they move from here back to Culp's Hill. But this is turning into a winning combination here for the 14th Brooklyn and the 6th Wisconsin. So we've moved across the Chambersburg Pike here and I want to reorient you. What you're looking at in the distance through the cars and the trees is the McPherson barn. That is where Edward Fowler would reorganize his men and form lines of battle facing directly at us on the camera here. Now behind us on the camera the 6th Wisconsin was coming into line and the Union infantry would position themselves along this rail fence here or one similar to it and they would begin delivering volleys against the Confederate forces that were located on the other side of this cut. You had the 42nd Mississippi, the 2nd Mississippi, and along with the 55th North Carolina who were not only threatening Hall's battery that was in this area but they were getting ready to roll up the entire Union defense here if the 6th Wisconsin, the 14th Brooklyn and the 95th New York didn't meet that threat. So they began delivering volleys and the Confederate forces had no choice but to jump into the cut for cover just like the unfinished railroad cut was used at 2nd Manassas. Except there was one issue with this cut. It was a lot deeper than the one utilized in the summer of 1862. So when they would hop into the cut, although initially it seemed like a strong position, it ended up being too steep for the defenders inside the closer the Union forces got. So right now we're advancing directly towards the railroad cut. So imagine charging into the teeth of the Confederate musketry here and there are accounts that state men fell with every step. So every step we're taking there's a man falling and we're gonna keep pushing towards this position here. And we're approaching the cut along with the monument to the 14th Brooklyn on this portion of the battlefield. Now, just a quick recap. They initially took the field near the Herps Woods, which is directly behind us on the camera here. I would say about two to 300 yards. So, we're about to get a full view of the railroad cut here. And you can see just how steep this position is. I mean, how could you be expected to fire out of this position? You literally have to scale the walls. And when you scale the wall and fire your musket, there is three regiments of Union infantry advancing towards you here. So the 6th Wisconsin would have been on the other side of this bridge here. And then on this side, you would have had the 14th Brooklyn and the 95th New York advancing through this field that you see the corn going on right now. Now, as the Union infantry got closer and closer, the Confederates within the cut realized that they were essentially in a death trap here. 
and once the Union infantry was on the ridge, they were able to just fire down into the cut. Some hand-to-hand -hand fighting ensued, but for the most part, the Confederates surrendered in large portions here on this area of the battlefield. And Colonel Edward Fowler himself personally had numerous regimental flags that were handed over to the 14th Brooklyn upon the Confederate surrender in this portion of the battlefield here. So here is the McPherson barn and we started our journey on the other side of that barn. We reformed in the field behind the McPherson barn and advanced across this field here reaching the railroad cut just through these trees here. And right before us here is the second monument to the 14th Brooklyn here at the Gettysburg Battlefield. And I'll give you a closer look. 14th Brooklyn, it reads, first engage the enemy between McPherson House and Reynolds Grove, move to this place, engage Davis's brigade which was taking up position near the railroad cut. So here is the second spot that the 14th fought on and bled for in the matter of an hour here at Gettysburg. And let's give you one last look at the cut here because I really hope the camera is doing justice here, just how deep it truly is. Now, I don't know if there was corn here at the time of the battle or what, but it doesn't get any better than walking the very ground that you read about or that you watch documentaries about. Here we are advancing on the railroad cut, which is just 20 to 30 yards in front of me here. And I'm walking on the very same ground that the 14th Brooklyn, the 95th New York, the 6th Wisconsin on the other side of the road here walked across and bled for. And they took care of this Confederate threat on their flank and they would reform with the rest of their brigade and fighting would continue to ensue in the late afternoon. And the Union First Corps along with elements of the 12th Corps would begin to push back through the town of Gettysburg and take up their positions for the next couple days. But that was the attack on the railroad cut with the 14th Brooklyn. And uh, although it may not seem like a large field, maybe 100 yards, 75 yards, but just imagine charging across this field into the teeth of mini balls, essentially. Um, yeah, my hat's off to them. I don't, I don't know if I can do that. At the Colonel's command, they rushed forward with a cheer. As the troops charging with dash and spirit reached this little eminence, they were met with murderous hail of musket balls. C.V. Turvis, 14th Brooklyn. The loss was very severe on our side but I think much greater on part of the enemy. Colonel Edward B. Fowler, commanding 14th Brooklyn. An order came down the line from who I cannot tell to lay down in a cut for a railroad nearby. Well, we obeyed and in obeying sacrificed our freedom for the cut was too deep to fire over except at the extreme left. Captain Woolard, 42nd Mississippi. So now we have worked our way to Culp's Hill, a position that be essentially became a fortress for the Union forces here. But even with the strength of this position, the Union right flank was in danger of collapsing on the night of July 2nd of 1863. We're about to touch on why. So we are standing in a position that was manned by the 137th New York. Now on the evening of July 2nd of 1863, this is the extreme right flank of the Union Army. The line ends here. Now originally, when Union forces occupied this hill earlier in the fight, Union forces stretched down this way. But during the July 2nd attacks, Union reinforcements were pulled from this area and sent south to reinforce the Union center and the Union left flank, leaving the 137th New York, commanded by David Ireland, the extreme right flank of the Union army. Now, when fighting would kick off here, Allegheny Johnson's division would be assaulting from this direction, you had Louisianians, Virginians, and then a mixed brigade in this area commanded by Maryland Stewart. And you had, I believe, the 23rd Virginia and the 10th Virginia essentially getting ready to overlap the Union line in this direction. 
And remember, these earthworks that were constructed down in this area were now vacant. So the Confederates were essentially getting ready to overlap the Union line here. Well, the 137th New York would refuse their line along a traverse that was constructed in this direction, essentially halting or at least slowing down the Confederate advance here. So now the 137th line would stretch in this direction. And just to kind of reorient you, the Confederates were coming from this general direction, getting ready to overlap the Union line and perhaps cut off the Baltimore Pike, which was a vital supply line. Well, you had the 84th New York, or the 14th Brooklyn, like we've been covering, the 6th Wisconsin, I believe the 147th New York, and a few other regiments were brought from the top of the hill near the observation tower to reinforce this area here because the 137th New York was doing all they could against an entire Confederate brigade. Now, as Colonel Fowler and the rest of the 14th Brooklyn were leaving their position near the observation tower, heading towards the Union right flank, one of General Green's aides, Lieutenant Cantine, would approach Fowler and pretty much direct him to this location. They'd be walking through some foliage when a voice would emit from the darkness, demanding their surrender. Colonel Fowler, not knowing this threat, would return back to his regiment and send two men out to the wood line here to determine if this was a friend or a foe. Now, those two men were musician John Cox and Sergeant James McGuire of Company I. And they would essentially advance in this general area and disappear into the darkness, trying to discover what force lies beyond the wood line here. Remember, it's pitch black in this area. A few moments later, shots would ring out from the woods and the members of the 14th Brooklyn were stating that they were in the teeth of flank fire. Cox would return with word that McGuire had been wounded somewhere in this wood line beyond here. Now, it was determined that these forces that the 14th Brooklyn encountered was the 10th Virginia, who had managed to get somewhat interwound in the lines here. So, Fowler would order his regiment into line of battle. They would deliver a few volleys into the wood line here and try and drive out the 10th Virginia. Now, there's also some accounts that after these volleys, the 14th Brooklyn charged into the woods and some hand-to-hand -hand combat ensued. But also I read that after these initial volleys, the 10th Virginia began to pull back to their lines due to them not having any support on their flanks. Now we are approaching the general area where the 14th Brooklyn would have been positioned. And we are about to see their third and final monument here at the Gettysburg Battlefield. And something that's interesting is they're the only regiment that has three monuments here on the Gettysburg Battlefield. So we were just right here. That's the 137th New York Monument, and that is their line. Their line was originally running this way. When things started getting a little dicey here, they refused their line in this direction here, essentially forming an L. The 84th came down from the observation tower and essentially helped man this location where they began fighting the 10th Virginia in this location. So the 84th would remain here for a few hours. They would be brought back. And their job essentially for the rest of the battle was filling in and relieving regiments along the Union line here. So they would man a position, fight there for a few hours, and they would pull back, rearm, and refit. And then they would relieve another regiment along the line here. And this continued on July 2nd and the remaining of the fighting on July 3rd. So what you're seeing here is the monument, or marker I should say, for the 14th Brooklyn here at Culp's Hill. So that was the Battle of Gettysburg through the eyes of the 14th Brooklyn. Now I mentioned that they're the only regiment that has three monuments here at the Gettysburg Battlefield. Culp's Hill, like we just saw, the railroad cut, and right next to the McPherson Barn near the Herps Woods. So if you're curious as to where those are, those are the locations. Uh, the 14th is a, obviously a very interesting and rich history. So it's an easy regiment to learn about. There's a lot of stuff out there about them. But I hope you learned a little bit about their fight here at Gettysburg. And uh, like I always say, we'll catch you on the next one.